In the name of God, source of life, eternal word, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Angels from the realms of glory. This is our Advent Sermon Series theme. And we'll be using two main sources for this, a book on sabbatical art that has been written by Mark Haydu, and also the art of Janet McKenzie, along with some weekly reflection questions. Although Advent officially begins next week, and today's the Feast of Christ the King, or the Reign of Christ, we are beginning with an art piece in St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican City called The Throne of St. Peter, which really is more of a sculpture and an architectural piece of art. I'm going to just show you that picture out of this book so that you have a sense of the magnificence and the sheer size that is involved in this. This, of course, was part of the expression of the theology of the day, which saw the Roman Catholic Pope as a direct spiritual descendant of St. Peter. The throne of St. Peter was designed by Gianni Lorenzo Bernini between 1647 and 1653. It's an ornate, extravagant, detailed piece of work with lots of gold and angels and clouds, and it is enormous. Any human pope sitting on the actual chair or the throne, which is made of wood, would be completely dwarfed by it. The design is such that it draws our eyes ever upwards until at the pinnacle is the only stained glass window in the entire basilica. The stained glass window is, is circular and it represents the eternal. And the image within the circle is a supernatural white dove representing the Holy Spirit with a radiant aureole in yellows and oranges. The wingspan alone of the dove in the window is 64 inches or just over a meter and a half. The implication of this dove image is that the Holy Spirit guides popes. There are four colossal bronze statues representing four doctors of the church which are near to the actual seat within the sculpture. The two statues in front of the seat represent the Latin church, and they are of St. Augustine and St. Ambrose. The two statues in the background, who look almost as if they're holding the chair, represent the Greek church and are St. Athanasius and St. John Chrysostom, or Chrysostom, whichever pronunciation you prefer. If you need to go and look at the picture again, please do Google it. So this throne of St. Peter reveals so much of the theology of that time, with heaven up there and earth down below, that there is a hierarchy spiritually both in heaven and on earth. Blessedly much, uh, not all, but much of this theology is no longer presented as truth or followed as such. We now know that God does not love or favour any one person more because of a particular office or vocation which they hold, nor does God's love diminish or lessen because we are, for example, not a priest or a nun. Given that in the last book of the Bible, Revelation, the throne of God is the source of the river of life and not an indication of God's authority, supremacy, or superiority? Isn't it time to re-look at some of the imaging that gave rise to this particular art piece as a throne and automatically leads into the perception of Jesus as being king, that we need to re-look at this as well. Yes, I know that we talk of him as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, but actually, Jesus himself never, never calls himself a king. 
In fact, the very opposite. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, we read Jesus as saying, I came not to be served, but to serve. And in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Even on the cross of Jesus' crucifixion, with the notice above his rear head, which read the King of the Jews, this was not his claim. It wasn't his words. They came from the Romans. So why? Why this need in us to call Jesus a king, or even God a king, or to enthrone a pope? Is it because we lack the language to convey adequately the supremacy, the greatness, the almightiness, the otherness of God, and so we resort to a human representation of this in earthly terms, in the form of a king? The problem with this is that this then starts to colour our thinking in terms of how we think of God in relation to leadership, greatness, power and authority, and we often humanise it. If only we can return to Jesus' constant incarnation of the radically alternative view of these and read these back into our view of God as well. Maybe we would begin to manifest a more readily redeemed world as well. Jesus always taught that the greatness of one's leadership is, or ideally should, be directly proportional to a person's humility. And very often, Jesus taught what God's greatness is not. It is not status and riches. It is not fame, nor triumph, nor power. Whilst none of these are bad in and of themselves, Jesus taught that they never its source nor its end. Now some of us might be thinking, but what about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, riding a donkey with people waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Wasn't this some sort of recognition and proclamation of Jesus' kingship? This is where background information and knowledge is really critical. Firstly, have you ever wondered how come there was a crowd all ready to meet Jesus, conveniently placed at that particular gate, that particular time on that particular day, through which he was entering, all primed, equipped with palm branches? It does seem a little bit unusual, a bit odd when we think about it. As we know, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was some few days before Passover, and he could have entered at any number of gates because Jerusalem had several gates. The priests in Jerusalem kept some flocks of sheep in Bethlehem, partly for the purpose of religious sacrifices, and certainly all the lambs of the Passover came from Bethlehem. The high priest would travel from Jerusalem to Bethlehem to find a perfect, unblemished lamb just before Passover. He would then carry this lamb back to Jerusalem and enter Jerusalem four days before Passover through the Eastern Gate. As the priest entered, people would gather with palm branches and sing praises to God. Hosanna to the Lamb of God who has come to take our sins away. Not long after the priest entered Jerusalem through this gate, it is probable that Jesus entered riding on the colt of a donkey. And this would explain why a crowd was already waiting. And they changed their Hosanna to include the words, Son of David, possibly because this was a common title used for Messiah in those days. And Jesus had recently performed the messianic sign of raising Lazarus from the dead after having been in the tomb for four days. Interestingly, just as an aside, the Eastern Gate is sealed now and the Muslim graveyard is there. 
I can, I'm sure we can all start seeing the significance of Jesus coming in through that gate and given what the high priest would have been doing just before that. In essence, Jesus, the ultimate Lamb of God, the ultimate sacrifice after whom no other sacrifices are needed, entered, enters Jerusalem through exactly the same gate through which the high priest had entered a few moments prior to this with an animal lamb to be sacrificed, which constantly has to be reenacted every year. By the way, Jesus riding in on a donkey is also significant. In ancient times, a king from a neighboring nation riding into Jerusalem, or any city for that matter, on a donkey would be seen as being on a mission of peace. If he came on a horse, then his mission was to make war. As we know, Jesus is the very embodiment of shalom, of peace. So, isn't it time to rename this feast of Christ the King? What would you call it? What about a celebration of service? After all, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 26 and 27, we read that Jesus said, Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Amen. Amen.